Good morning and welcome to Moore Park Presbyterian Church. Uh, if you are, have been a part of this church since in inception years and years and years ago, or if you're here for the very first time, we're, we're just glad that you've joined us this morning. As we begin 2021, again, I'm Keenan Barber. This is Sean Mead. Say good morning, Sean Mead. Good morning, Sean Mead. I knew you were going to do that. Uh, we're uh, excited to start the new year, excited uh, to start with a place of having Christ at the center uh, of it all. And so um, with no further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Sean to pray for us as we begin our time together. Great. Let's pray together this morning. Almighty God, we come before you today grateful for this new year that we enter into. Lord, grateful for a chance to have life and breath and the opportunity to follow you, to do your work, to draw closer to you. Lord, may that begin here this morning, Lord. We ask that you would teach us from your word, that you would allow us, Lord, even as we are distanced, to fellowship together through worship and prayer. We ask this all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, well, let's continue this morning in our service as we go and spend some time together in worship with Joe and Alex and the band. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> and Happy New Year to all you out there with us at home. If you'd like to stand and sing with us, we invite you to rise now. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to work me. But in Bethlehem's home there was found no room for thy holy nativity. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. Heaven's For sure, in uh, the year 2020, uh, there is a lot to 
uh, we want to leave behind, and there's a lot that in 2021 we are looking forward to as well. Uh, one of the things uh, in the next month or so, we're going to be entering into a series talking about uh, technology um, and how we as Christians can have wisdom as we interface and work with technology. Um, I'm wondering off the top of your head, Sean, I know that you have lots of time to think about this. Um, as you think about that, as I sort of say that, what, what's the first thing that comes to your mind in terms of Christians, technology, how that all plays together um, or doesn't play together? Yeah, I mean, there's part of it that, you know, I just automatically think through, like from a parent's point of view, hmm. uh, just navigating the ever-changing world of social media, technology, you know, kids have more and more technology, younger and younger. You know, it's kind of that thing where we used to know how to work the technology that our parents didn't know how to work, and now we are those parents who, you know, I, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll always know how to do this, and I don't. My kids know more about it than I do. But helping them to navigate that with a Christian worldview and what does that look like, especially, I think, you know, not just from a parenting point of view, but for all of us, uh, social media and how that affects us and how that, um, I guess, influences almost every aspect of our mm. life, you know, and, and Alexa and all these different things. Like somebody's house right now, there's a little device that when I say the word Alexa, it's just, Alexa, turn off the lights, you're welcome. Uh, you know, like that kind of thing. Like it's just a very different world when you think back to when we grew up. And uh, I think just anything we can do to, you know, the, the God's Word doesn't say, here's how you should interact with Facebook, but it does give us principles that tell us how we should interact with these different things. And so I think that's a great thing for us to explore. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Sean and I will be uh, kind of working on that series together, presenting that series together. You're finding it out for the first time right this moment. It sounds like fun. I, yeah. yeah <laughs> I knew that you'd be uh, ready for that <laughs> roller coaster ride to begin right here this morning. Uh, that's kind of the way technology works, right? It's all of a sudden it's just right in our face, and we got to we got to react and, and have uh, an appropriate response. Uh, for you, you're starting uh, renew on Tuesday. Back back in yeah. the uh, back in the saddle with that. Tell us what that looks like this next week. Um, so renew 6:30 to 8 p.m. here on campus. We're outside. Uh, we're still wearing masks. We're socially distanced. We're we're really following the strictest uh, COVID protocols to just guarantee that people are safe. Um, but as long as we're able to and allowed to just feel like it's the, the best thing for the kids to be able to get together like this. And uh, we're going we're gonna to keep seeking the wisdom and leadership of our elders to make sure that we're doing the right thing. But um, there's, there's so many kids coming right now because they just don't have anywhere else to connect. And, um, and you know, this is a season where I think everybody needs a little bit of hope. Yeah. And there's no greater hope than what we find in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, and so uh, that's a great transition, I think, to our time of prayer this morning. A couple of things to let you know about in the life of the church. Obviously, there um, that uh, the the bulletin that we send out on um, Saturdays uh, before the service um, within it has a link to a prayer list. I, I highly encourage you to to open that up each week, um, print it out, and uh, put it on your refrigerator, put it on your bathroom window. Um, mirror, I mean, and wherever it is that you're going to see it over a period of time, and, and maybe just be in the habit of us being connected as the church by being in prayer for one another. Uh, I know there are, um, you know, we did a, a couple of memorial services as a church, and so there's families that are hurting from this last year, um, people that they've, uh, loved ones that they've lost. Um, and then uh, in just the last few days, we, we know that um, Alec Cast um, has been in the hospital um, the report this morning is that things are looking much better, um, and so hopefully he'll be released in the next day or so uh, from there. And um, Dennis Migliazzo um, went in for an angiogram and then had a stent put in and then had some other issues last night. I think um, this morning um, is hopefully on the mend and looking okay, um, but had kind of an adverse reaction even um, last night. And so um, just a, a lot happening uh, in the life of the church. And so pay attention to that prayer list. You really can have the, the best, most updated information there. The only reason we wouldn't have that particular list updated with something that maybe you know about would be that someone hasn't given us permission. 
We were always asking for people's permission before we put their name or their information up there. And so if it's up there, they've given us permission and they want uh, invite prayer. And there are others who are a little bit more private and that's completely fine. It may be that they just would like the elders or the deacons or the leadership of the church to pray for them, but they'd prefer to not have it written somewhere. So if you don't find it there, don't feel like, hey, the church missed out on that. It may be that the family just preferred to not have it on that list. But I think all of that um, is a good uh, segue into um, us spending some time as the church um, praying uh, for the people in our church who are, who are in desperate need, um, and for people outside of the church as well. Lots happening in the world. Um, and so let's, as the church, uh, just spend some time uh, praying together this morning. Would you, would you join me? Um, close your eyes, bow your heads. Um, I feel like I'm talking to preschoolers, but there's times when you're watching something on a television screen or a computer screen or an iPad or uh, a phone, and it doesn't feel like you're really engaged, but sometimes we need our physical bodies to actually do something in order that we might be able to engage um, in the activity that God is calling to. So would you pray with, uh, with us this morning? Uh, Lord God, we, um, we, we love our church, and, and we know that there are many in our church who are hurting. We know that um, the, the end of last year was a difficult time um, as we as a church came together for a couple of memorial services and know that there were other things happening um, with other families where, where family members were lost. And so we just pray that um, they would be able to grieve well as the kind of the, uh, the craziness of the season has now um, kind of come uh, slowly to a, a close and the quiet of their house is there. Um, we just pray that as a church we would discern and know how to come alongside of those folks who are really having a difficult time and who are grieving um, in this time. And for, for Dennis and Alec and for others uh, in our church who are uh, dealing with health issues, um, we know that Alec's uh, wife Julie as well and other families in our church who are dealing with COVID-related types of things, we just pray that you would bring healing, um, that you would bring health, um, and you would continue to give our, our little hospital here in Las Robles or the Simi Hospital, e any of those places, God, would you give the workers there uh, just a sense of your strength um, and your wisdom to know how best to address all the things that are happening uh, in the health world uh, in these moments. And uh, for our world, um, for our political system that's still uh, broken, for our racial system that still has lots of unrest, and for many other things. Um, we lift them to you knowing that you are the God of peace. Not that you're going to bring resolution to those different circumstances, God, but you will bring a sense of your peacefulness to us as your people, and we'd be able to walk into situations filled by your Spirit, uh, knowing that we can uh, bring peace bringers um, to those different situations. Um, we're thankful for our church um, that um, has been just very faithful over this last year of, of craziness with COVID and everything else, and thankful that financially they've been very faithful, and prayerfully they've been very faithful, and just pray that in this next year um, that we might continue to be encouraged by your Spirit to be together as the body of Christ and to uh, lift people up and to support people and continue to do the great work that you call us to. Uh, Lord, um, we're just thankful. We're thankful to you and for your goodness to us and your love for us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Keenan. Well, this morning we continue now in our worship with the time of offering. And as Keenan said, uh, thank you for your faithfulness mm -hmm. uh, throughout the entire year of 2020, but also particularly over the last few weeks. And now we enter into this new year and there's an opportunity for us to continue to give to the church and continue to really be part of what God is doing in and through MPC. And so uh, as we continue on in our worship, uh, you'll see a couple of ways that uh, up on the screen that you can contribute to the church. Um, and just to remember that this is part of what we do. Uh, this is part of who we are as a church and part of our spiritual act of worship is to give back to the Lord as he has given to us. Let's continue in our worship now.
from wherever you've been, heart broken hearted and then rescued again. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come me. Earth has a sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has a sorrow that heaven can heal. Upon you 
and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Lord bless you.
Amen. Okay. <laughs> that was wonderful. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Dave Wilkinson, and I had the privilege of serving as the uh, founding pastor here at Moore Park Presbyterian Church, and I had the great wisdom of retiring six years ago, so I do not have to spend my life, as Keenan does, as a televangelist. But I am very, very impressed by what uh, is happening here. We watch every Sunday morning, and the uh, work of uh, Keenan, uh, Sean, the, the staff, the tech people, the band, has just been outstanding. And I am, I mean, I work with a lot of churches. I'm the stated clerk for San Fernando Presbytery and uh, get to know what's going on in, in all the churches. And I'm just very impressed with what is happening here at uh, my home church, MPC, and I'm just so glad to be a part of this congregation. In the 25th chapter of the book of Exodus, God is speaking to Moses, and God is giving some very precise, hugely detailed instructions for the construction of the, the sanctuary, uh, the, the tabernacle, and the place that he's going to uh, meet with the people of Israel. And part of the instructions that we find are found in chapter 25, verses uh, 10 through 22. God says to Moses, they shall construct an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide and one and a half cubits high. And you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out, you shall overlay it, and you shall make a gold molding around it. And you shall cast four gold rings on for it and fasten them on its four feet, and two rings shall be on one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. And you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide and you shall make two cherubim of gold and make them of hammered work at two ends of the mercy seat and make one cherub at one end of the at one cherub at the other end you shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat of the other and the cherubim shall have their wings spread upward covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another the faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat and you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony which I shall give to you. And there I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. Let's pray. Pray now, Lord, that your word may come to us, but not just with my words, but with the power and the ministry of your Holy Spirit into our lives this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the northern Sinai Desert, beyond the richly productive region of El Arish, is a, an area of huge sand dunes. Now these great dunes move with the prevailing winds, and at times, they actually bury the road. Carol and I enjoy travel, and before COVID, we actually used to go more interesting places even than Simi Valley. And some years ago, we took a bus from Jerusalem to Cairo. At times, on our trip to the Sinai, the road had been reduced to a single lane or less by the encroaching sand. Our guide Hassan told us that the Egyptian government maintains plows to push back the sand, just like we push back snow in the Sierras. Now, the only thing that was moving in this desolate region were Bedouin and their camels. There would be a, a patch of small brush and a sheltered area, and occasionally we would see a bright green tree rising above the sand. And this tree, our guide Hassan told us, is the acacia. The acacia is able to, to survive in this hostile environment and even flourish. They are hardy, they require very little water, and they're extremely resistant to insect damage. 
Now, as the people of Israel travel through the Sinai on their way to the Promised Land after the exodus from Egypt, the acacia becomes a, a familiar and a very welcome sight. The leaves of the tree and the fruit are, are good food for animals, and the astringent bark is good for tanning leather. But it is Mount Sinai itself where the acacia becomes especially significant for Israel. There, as we read, God gives Moses the very precise instructions for building the Ark of the Covenant, which was to hold the tablets of the law. God goes into considerable detail with Moses about how his Ark is to be constructed. And one of the instructions that God gives Moses is that the Ark and the poles to carry the Ark are to be built from the wood of the acacia tree. Now, there are a number of possible reasons for this choice. Uh, The acacia wood is hard. It can receive a high polish, although that wouldn't be especially important because the whole thing is going to be covered with gold. It's also durable. But there are other woods like cedar that are more beautiful and more durable. So why does God choose acacia as the wood for his ark? the sign of his presence with the people of Israel. Why does God also choose acacia for the building of the the table for the bread of the Passover and the long boards to be used in the construction of the tabernacle itself? He chose it because it's the wood that is available. I mean, no other wood grows in the Sinai desert. It's all acacia all the time. Acacia was chosen for a holy purpose simply because it was there and it was available. And there's a lesson for us today in the choice of the acacia and the reasons for that choice. God says, if you can't be with the wood you love, lathe the wood you're with. Now that is a terrible pun on an old song by Stephen Stills that told us, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Now it's terrible, but you'll you'll remember it. Now for those of you who don't remember the original song, I've asked our, our hugely versatile band to sing one stanza. But let me tell you first of all, before they sing, that the relationship in advice in this song has not been approved by the MPC staff or session. I do not approve of it either. The advice is terrible. Take it away. One, two, well, there's a road. Okay, don't do that. (laughs) If you cannot be with the one you love, behave yourself. Read a book or take a walk. But on the other hand, if you cannot be with the wood you love, lathe the wood you're with. Remember that God is able to take the material that lies at hand, that is available, and make it holy. Just like he took a nondescript bush on a mountainside, set it on fire, and used it as the place where he spoke to Moses and set in motion the freeing of his people. And as the people of God, we are called to make holy those things that are close to our hands, to make the most of the opportunities we are given each day. This is the time and the place God has given us. We may not like it, a few do. In the Lord of the Rings, Frodo says to Gandalf, I wish it need not have happened in my time. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given. We have to decide what to do with the time that is given to us. We do not have to wait for a better virus-free time to serve God and serve people. 
In the same way, you do not need to go and hunt for a, a holy vocation, some sort of particularly Christian employment. You are called instead to make your present vocation holy, to make the place where you work an avenue of Christian conduct, concern, and compassion for co-workers, for customers, for employers. All Christian vocation is the same. The word vocation means calling, voca, vocal. And there's only one calling that we have as Christians, to belong to Jesus Christ and to demonstrate his reconciling love to the world. As Christians, our vocation is the same. It's only our location that's different. And sometimes we are called to make the best use of what we have to work with to get as many people as we can, as close to Jesus as we can, and trust the Holy Spirit to take it from there. In Elmer Bedinger's book, The Fall of Fortresses, he describes a World War II bombing run over the German city of Kassel. He writes, our B-17, the Tondaleo, was attacked by German fighters. Now this was not unusual. But on, these, on this particular occasion, our gas tanks were hit. And later, as I reflected on the miracle of a 20 millimeter explosive shell piercing the fuel tank without cutting off an explosion, our pilot, Bon Fox, told me it wasn't quite that simple. On the morning following the raid, Bon had gone down to ask the crew chief uh, for that shell as, as a souvenir of unbelievable luck. The crew chief told Bon that not just one shell, but 11, had been found in the gas tank. 11 unexploded shells where just one was enough to blast us out of the sky. It was as if the seas had been parted for us. And even now, after 35 years, so awesome an event leaves me shaken. Especially after I heard the rest of the story from Bon. He told me that the, the shells had been sent to the armorers to be defused. And the armorers told him that intelligence had picked them up. They could not say why at the time, but Bon eventually sought out the answer. Apparently, when the armors opened each of those shells, they found no explosive charge. They were as clean as a whistle and just as harmless. Empty? Well, not all of them. One contained a carefully rolled piece of paper. And on it was a scrawl in check. The intelligence people scoured our base for a man who could recheck, and eventually they found one to decipher the note. It set us marveling. Translated, the note read, this is all we can do for you now. Those Czech slave laborers in the Nazi armament industry seemed to be in a hopeless situation, a situation where they could not do a thing for the freeing of their country. But they took the opportunity to hand, not knowing what the result, the outcome was going to be, and they made the most of it. And they made a difference. And we can do the same even if we have been dealt a rough hand. If you can't be with the wood you love, lathe the wood you're with. God expects us to start not where we would like to be, but where we are. Even in the middle of a worldwide epidemic. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells the parable that we call the parable of the talents. And the operating principle of the kingdom of God that Jesus sets out in this parable is that the one who is faithful in a few things will be made responsible for many things. And the one who is not faithful in a few things will have an, even those few things taken away. Jesus says, For everyone who has shall more be given, and he shall have an abundance. But for the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. You know, at, at times, the number of times I've heard people say, if only God would give me an opportunity, I would do great things for him. 
But God does give us opportunities every day. And what we do with the what we do with what we are given to do is going to determine the opportunities we have for the future. I mean, there's no reason to think that you would be an effective missionary overseas if you're not an effective missionary in your own office. There's no reason to think that you would be an effective counselor if you've lost communication with your own family. There's no reason to think that God should entrust you with the stewardship of a large fortune if you do not demonstrate good stewardship of what you have now. You know, so often in looking for that great thing to do for God, we, you know, or the great thing to do for our church or our fellow people, we forget that our qualifications is how we now perform the more personal matters that are close to hand. That's what Jesus tells us in the parable. Now, it may be that there are some listening this morning, and I would be pretty surprised if there were not, who are living with if-onlys in parts of their lives. If only I had a better job. If only my husband, my wife, my children, whoever, would do this or this other thing. If only the virus hadn't messed up my plans. If only I was first in line for the vaccine. If only, if only, if only. And I have them too. Just last week, as I, I listened to Keenan's sermon, I realized that I was holding on to resentments about some of the losses in my own life. I resented not being able to be up close and personal with my family. I resented not being able to travel. I, I resented every day just feeling like blur's day. And I frankly felt like I was owed something better by God or by the world, by, by someone. And this feeling of frustrated entitlement was closing me off to what God might be looking to do in and through me right now. And so I say to myself, as I say to you, if you can't be with the wood you love, lathe the wood you're with. If you feel that you're stuck out in a desert, Remember that God can build his ark and his tabernacle with the material at hand. And he can do the same in our lives. If only. If only we are willing to seek his will and demonstrate his love, not in what ought to be, but what is. We hope for better things in 2021. I mean, it'd be hard to get worse than 2020. But even if 2021 is absolutely, totally wonderful, it will still not be as good as it gets, not by a long shot. We have a wide open future. And we are reminded of that once again as we gather here at the table of the Lord. The Lord's Supper doesn't just look back at the night that Jesus sat with his disciples there in that upper room, as important as that is. It also looks forward to that joyful feast of the people of God that we're going to share with our Lord and our brothers and sisters forever. So, even if you are in a desert, make the very most of the desert you are in. And God promises that he will lead you to fertile country. For the one who is faithful in a few things, we put in charge of many things. Let's pray. Lord, we pray as we come together here at your table that you will set these elements apart from a common to a very sacred juice so that as we eat and as we drink, we may truly share your body, your blood, but also that foretaste of that wonderful messianic feast when we will gather with all of your people from north, south, east, and west at the table of our Lord. The Apostle Paul talks to us about the Lord's Supper. He wrote to the Corinthians, about the Lord's Supper, and he said, For I repeat to you what I received, how the Lord Jesus, on the night when he's betrayed, first of all, took bread, and he broke it, 
And he gave it to them, and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this, remembering me. And then, the same way, after they'd eaten, our Savior also took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, This cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. Let us come now in our homes, outside, wherever you are, at the table of the Lord. Amen. an opportunity to uh, take the elements and to uh, participate in communion. We're going to spend a, a moment in prayer together, so let's pray. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you for all that you give us. Thank you for this table that allows us to come, not because of some way that we've behaved correctly or because we've earned our way there or because we've earned perfect marks as Christians or whatever else, that's just that we've put our hope and faith in you and by your grace you invite us to be at the table. And that it's the smallest bit of juice and the smallest bit of bread that gives us the nutrition we need, the spiritual nutrition we need in order to move forward in the things that you're calling us to. God, we're thankful that uh, you have taught us a prayer, that you taught your disciples to pray, that we pray together now, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to continue in our time of worship uh, with this last uh, song from the band. Again, I'm going to invite you to stand and sing with me. We stand and lift up joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down, worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing.
So uh, this last Tuesday, I was at the Moore Park Pantry Plus, and a, a car drove up, and uh, a little old lady was in the front seat, and she said, uh, in the back, there's a bag of carrots. And so I uh, took the carrots and uh, pulled them out, and um, a sixth grader uh, took those carrots and divided them up, and probably there were... I don't know, 10 bags of carrots, but they split them into two. So he took about four or five carrots and put them into different bags that were going to go be going to different families. Um, and you would think little old lady and sixth grader, probably not going to have a big impact on the kingdom. But I can tell you that every week, uh, Linda and Ted Dahl uh, come by the Moore Park Pantry Plus. That's the day that they do their grocery shopping. And they happen to find something in the grocery store that maybe is on sale or whatever else. And they have them pack it up and put it in the back of their car, and they come by the Moore Park Pantry Plus, and she pops her trunk. Someone grabs those things out of the back. And so as, uh, as immunocompromised as Ted Dahl is, Linda and Ted are pretty much consistent every week to come, and I get a chance to see them as we see them on Tuesday mornings. And this week it was carrots. And a sixth grader who happens to be my son took those and put them into different boxes. And 20 different families had carrots this last week because the dolls dropped those by and because a sixth grader put them in boxes. If you're wondering what you can do in the kingdom, listen to what Pastor Dave had said this morning. I have to read it because I'll mess up it up. It says, if you can't be with the wood you love, lave the wood you're with. Okay. You need to be present to where you are. You need to look for the places where God is calling you to serve. And if you don't think that you can serve or you have nothing to offer, let me tell you the little old lady and the sixth grader in this church have found a place to be able to impact the community in some say, shape or form. If they can do it, then so can you. We've got lots of different opportunities within the life of the church. But most importantly, God wants us to not just take the love and grace that he's given us, but he actually wants us to do something with it, even at a time of a pandemic, even the difficult challenges that we have ahead of us, God is still calling us to be the church. And so I'm thankful for that reminder from Pastor Dave this morning. And so the end, uh, the benediction is just a good word. The good word is go taking your vocation and take it to your location and have a ridiculous effect on our community with the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We look forward to being with you next Sunday, 9 o'clock, uh, Renew, Tuesday night, 6.30. Um, lots of things happening in the life of the church. Um, you're going to get a special communication this next week. Our newsletter is actually going to be changing a little bit, changing its form. You'll be getting a kind of a, a piece of the newsletter kind of each week, uh, midweek, to get you updated on things that are happening in the life of the church, and so pay attention to that coming as well. It'll give you even more ways, again, to dive into the life of the church. And so have a great week, uh, MPC visitors. Hopefully you'll join us back next week. Thanks for coming.